Geeks, Romans, socialists, lend me your ears. Calling out to you from the far reaches of the internet, this is Alexis Goldstein. And this is Jesse Meyerson, and you're listening to Disorderly Conduct, our finance and economics podcast with Tarbell NYC. We'll begin today with an update on something we covered way back in episode three. New protections for people saving for retirement. And we'll discuss why Obama deserves some credit for doing the right thing on it. Then we'll try and figure out what the deal was with the agreement the Syriza government uh, in Greece reached with the representatives of European capital. Both sides are claiming victory, and we'll look at one take for either side, both from the left. And lastly, we'll hear from members of the Corinthian 15, students who got ripped off by the for-profit school Corinthian Colleges, Inc., and by the Department of Education, and who have had enough. Last week, they bravely declared a debt strike. We'll be speaking to two of the strikers, Deanda Wiley and Tasha Courtright. And as a reminder, please subscribe to us on iTunes and rate us if you like us. You can do that right now by going to bit.ly slash discontpodcast. HTTP colon slash slash B-I-T <laughs> dot L-Y slash discontpodcast. Up, up, and away! So long-time disorderly conduct listeners may remember once upon a time in a universe far, far away, we talked to you about the idea of a fiduciary standard, which sounds boring, but is actually really important. And the basic idea behind this is when you are saving money for your retirement, uh, you know, in the small likelihood that you have any money that you can save for retirement, when you go about doing that, the person that is advising you on your retirement savings is supposed to be making recommendations that secure your financial future instead of lining their pocket with a bunch of money. But the reality in the United States is that a lot of retirement plans do not have that boring sounding term, a fiduciary standard, meaning that your retirement advisor if you have what's called an IRA, for example, is perfectly 100% legally allowed to recommend that you buy certain securities that they are simultaneously getting a kickback from a mutual fund for recommending. So even though it may not be the right kind of mutual fund for you and may lose you money in the long term, your retirement advisor can totally pocket some cash for trying to steer you into that investment. So Way back when, in 2010, the Department of Labor had an idea, and their idea was that we should close these kinds of loopholes in the fiduciary standard that allow for these kinds of conflicts of interest, and they created a proposal. And Wall Street hyperventilated and freaked out and said that this was interfering with consumer choice, right? It's whenever you're talking about screwing over consumers, uh, Wall Street lobbyists always like to talk about choice because I don't know about you, Jesse, but when I'm thinking about consumer choice, I want to make sure that I have the right to get screwed over. It's very important to me. It's very important to have that choice. I mean, you, you want to choose either to have like some super secure retirement security and like a, a real, uh, you know, like safety net that you can fall back on in your old age when you don't want to go out and do backbreaking work. Or you also want to be able to choose to put it in some risky investments that the uh, person who's advising you on your uh, IRA gets a kit bat from so that maybe you can, uh, you know, live on cat food when you're 90. Yeah, you know, freedom, eagle. Goals, that sort of thing. So what we covered in the past is in 2013, Representative Ann Wagner of Missouri had advocated for a piece of legislation that would basically block the Department of Labor from ever writing a rule meant to protect uh, retirement savers from uh, you know, advisors who didn't have their best interest in mind. And a bunch of Republicans supported her bill. A bunch of Democrats also supported her bill. 30 Democrats voted for it. And um, and that's what we covered. So if you are a longtime listener, this will sound vaguely familiar. And you'll so, remember that that um, I, I, I think I, if if I'm correct, then this was the one that I absolutely busted a gut on being yeah, so you were furious. You were I was very pissed. furious. Because of the excellent reporting of a friend of the show, Dave Dayan, in The New Republic, um, uh, which uh, revealed what a huge, you know, uh, take. The, the, the industry captures two-thirds of the profits from these retirement accounts. That means that 
all of the like two thirds, the majority of the money that um you know the that is earning in interest uh is not going to you, the person who's saving up for retirement. It's going to these assholes who are already soaking up. I mean, <laughs> there's ten point five trillion dollars invested in retirement funds. This is like the biggest, well, or not the biggest, but like the vast majority of the public stock or the of the 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 capital stock that's owned by a large number of people, right? Not just like a few capitalists at the top. This is the vast majority of that. So for the industry to be taking two thirds of that, I think got me really pissed off. And as you can probably tell, it hasn't really waned in the intervening period. (laughs) Right. So this bill um, from 2013 has been reborn. It has a new life uh, by the same representative, uh, Representative Ann Wagner. And believe it or not, this new bill goes even further than the last bill. The last bill said that the Department of Labor couldn't write a rule trying to protect retirement savers until the Securities and Exchange Commission wrote their own rule and finalized that rule, which is kind of like a convoluted way of saying you can never write a rule because the SEC has shown absolutely zero interest in getting off of their butts and writing any kind of a rule like that, which may have something to do with the fact that Mary Jo White, who is the chair of the SEC, used to be a prominent attorney defending big Wall Street bankers. Um, The other thing that Representative Wagner's new bill does is it says that the SEC has to consider the lost commissions that would result from any new fiduciary standard. So translation, the new bill says that the SEC has to report to the House Financial Services Committee about how much money Wall Street would lose if we all of a sudden eliminate or try to eliminate some of these conflicts of interest. It's bananas. It's, yeah, 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 we know that Americans are losing $17 billion a year because of all of the bad advice that these kickbacks incentivize, but that's $17 billion dollars a year that brokers are pilfering from the american people and what about those brokers they're gonna lose 17 million dollars that they are no longer stealing from the american public and won't someone please think of the brokers who will look out for the brokers on main street alexis i ask you this with all of these uh <laughs> hard retiree or future retirees saving up money that could be rightfully pilfered that's right so here's the part that's surprising, right? You're probably used to us being pretty uh, negative on this show. President Barack Obama has come out in favor of doing the right thing on this, and he's come out in favor of it in a really big way. He had a speech at AARP. He was standing in front of Senator Elizabeth Warren, who up until this point was essentially his nemesis. Um, he and Elizabeth Warren went head to head at the end of last year over a big fight over the spending bill, which had had a Wall Street giveaway tucked into it. And you have Elizabeth Warren applauding the president. And basically, the president has embraced this very strong rhetoric saying that, and this is a quote, quote, if your business model rests on taking advantage, bilking hardworking Americans out of their retirement money, then you shouldn't be in business, end quote. And so he has come out in favor of the Department of Labor's um, it's going to be reproposed, so it's the same idea that they had back in 2010, but they're going to repropose it. Um, and he put out this whole fact sheet. He had his Council of Economic Advisors do that estimate about the, which is where I got that number from. The fact that Americans lose 17 billion a year because of this bad advice. Uh, and there's a whole website. There's a little video. So he's really going hard. And this, in my mind, represents a real rhetorical and political shift for him. And this says to me that all of the noise that we made at the end of last year and all of the noise that all manner of progressives have been making for a long time is finally having an impact on him. And he's feeling the pressure to track to the left. Um, And he's not the only one. There's one representative John Delaney of Maryland. He actually is the congressperson for my mother, and I always tell her to tweet at him and email him and call him about all of his (laughs) horribly pro-industry terrible votes because he almost always votes with Wall Street. But he and he voted with Wall Street in the in 2013. But he's changed his mind, and he was there at the AARP event. Um, And he basically was like, oh, there's new data. And now I'm convinced that this is a problem, which like, I I don't know. But uh, he's come around on this, too. So I really feel like, you know, they may just be pretending uh, and they may just be using rhetoric. But some of the Democrats are really feeling the pressure and starting to use Wall Street reform as a wedge issue to differentiate themselves from Republicans. And that, I think, is worth celebrating and uh, giving kudos to. 
even uh, if it's just a minor, minor victory. You sound like a real Obama bot sellout. I'll tell you that oh, much. I you mean, know. I, I, I think he should have said, if your business model rests on bilking hardworking people, then go fuck yourself. And if he didn't say that, <laughs> I, I think he's going a little soft on them. Can we, can we, um, can we uh, dig a little bit into this, uh, this question of Democrats sort of differentiating themselves from other Democrats by uh, going after the financial services industry? Because Politico recently, I know this is a curveball, Alexis, I didn't mention to you that I was going to bring this up because I didn't know until right this fucking moment. Um, Politico did this piece about centrist Democrats kind of gearing up to take on what they're calling the Warren wing. And it's got, you know, all the usual people, the uh, third wayers, the sort of like uh, holdovers from the Clinton era saying things like we want it. One of them, this guy, Gabe Horowitz, is the head of, I guess, third ways economic program, said that uh, uh, he was making that moderates had been making the case to rebrand the Democratic Party as being about the middle class which it's a surprise to me to hear that anybody thinks the Democrats need to rebrand as being about the middle class because right. that's like all they ever right. fucking talk about. They never mention the poor. They never mention redistribution. Howard Dean is in there calling uh, Elizabeth Warren's uh, rhetoric too strong. Uh, and so, you know, it, it, in a sense, like the the – I think this is like another sign that you're right, that like she has really kind of like cast the die. I don't know if that's the correct metaphor because I don't even really know what that means. But that um, like she, she's like set a standard and then people are, are like, you know, get, getting in the uh, kind of like combat position about this. And I, I just want to throw one uh, more interesting name into this mix who's taking advantage of this situation, which is Karl Rove. I don't know if you saw his ad that he released, but it um, attacks Hillary Clinton. It shows her. Uh, with, you know, lots of photos of her with like, you know, Saudi and Omani royalty and, you know, cause she does all this fundraising for the Clinton, Clinton global initiative and stuff. Uh, and so she's making all these deals with all these unsavory characters. And it says, you know, $8 billion here, $19 billion here, whatever it is. And so it's Rove cutting this anti-Clinton ad implying that she's like do, making shady business deals with foreign governments, which maybe she is and maybe she isn't. But the audio for the ad is, is a recording of a speech that Elizabeth Warren gave saying like, um, you know, our, our politicians making deals with big business, uh, you know, like subverts our democracy and all this kind of stuff. And Elizabeth Warren has not denounced that ad to the best of my knowledge. She certainly hadn't like two or three days afterwards. So she's like really playing some hardball politics. And I think it's really excellent. And I think as we can see from the president's uh, uh change in rhetoric and the about face by your mom's Maryland congressman, uh, I think it's having some real effect, I, I, not to mention the, the like um, defensive, the partly defensive posture that's being taken up by, you know, third way Democrats. I mean, I think that's right. And I think we saw a little taste of this. As I mentioned, at the end of last year, there was a really good article um, at the next New Deal, which is the blog of the Roosevelt Institute by Richard Kirsch, which basically uh, the headline was the budget fight was the first skirmish in the war for the soul of the Democratic Party. And I really do think that we're seeing the Democratic Party having to contend with who do we want to be? Do we want to be the softer, lighter Republican? Or do we, you know, and still the party of Wall Street? Or do we want to be something different? And I don't think that the answer to that question has been decided yet. And I think presidential primaries are a good way to try to decide it. Or at least, you know, a good way to decide what the message is, maybe not the actual, you know, living up to the policy with policy that matches the message is a is another thing entirely. But like the, the Democrats have been really bad just on the messaging for the longest time. So if even the messaging shifts i feel like that's that's a step in the right totally direction. and and it's worth noting that like there isn't actually going to be a decision about this because this it's not like this is a new battle that elizabeth warren started right like i remember in 2004 when howard dean was running and his whole when the his whole candidacy was predicated on like i'm from the paul wellstone wing the democratic wing of the democratic party and why are you know his his big speech that he that I, first came to my attention and lots of people's attention he was like um what i want to know is and it was like what i want to know is why so many democrats are lining up behind the president's blah 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 why uh, what i want to know is why blah, blah 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 and so this fight is sort of continually uh being fought um, and this is just sort of the latest iteration of it. And, we, you know, you can always kind of read the new things as tea leaves. But one uh, depressing thing about it is that Howard Dean, who was like sort of the standard bearer for the what he called the Democratic wing of the Democratic Party uh, a decade ago, has now switched sides and is now telling Elizabeth Warren that though she's right on the policy, she needs to tone down the rhetoric. Yes. Well, I think uh, we will have to watch this space. And uh, I think, you know. We'll see what happens and hopefully 
Uh, I hate to say the Elizabeth Warren wing of the party because there's so many other progressives that deserve credit, uh, like Sherrod Brown, for example. But uh, yes, we will see which faction of the Democratic Party wins. So watch this space. Next up, we are going to look at writings from NYU's Nantina Vgonsas, our guest on the last episode, who thinks that the Greece-Europe deal was a capitulation on the part of Syriza. And Jamie Galbraith, uh, prof- economics professor at University of Texas at Austin and a member of Greek finance minister Yanis Varoufakis' inner circle, who thinks that Syriza won out. Tell our listeners what the heck is going on with the Syriza party in Greece. Oh, man, it's so difficult to know (laughs) because I'm not there. And, you know, the people who I trust on these matters uh, themselves seem to disagree. I want to dig into two uh, essays. One is by a friend of the show, Nantina Gonsas, who was on last show. People might remember she's a a PhD candidate at NYU in sociology, Greek-American, will be uh, going back to Greece this summer to look at the changing landscape for labor within the new sort of uh, political context. Um, She thinks that uh, the deal, the provisional deal that the Greek government struck with uh, the representatives of European capital, you know, the central bankers, Angela Merkel, those folks, she thinks that it was a basically a capitulation, a, a loss for Syriza. Uh, and I'll, I'll, so we'll go into her piece a little bit, which was in Jacobin called Syriza and the Radical Break. Uh, look at why she thinks it was a capitulation. And then we'll turn to uh, Jamie Galbraith, who's a, a Left wing, but not quite as left wing as Nantina, uh, professor of economics at the University of Texas at Austin, who uh, was in Brussels with uh, Greek finance minister Yanis Varoufakis, who previously Jamie Galbraith had brought to UT Austin, um, uh, who has a much more favorable view uh, of the terms that Syriza uh, was able to sort of wrangle out of it, says that they won uh, a skirmish, if not a battle, in a longer war, and then uh, gives his reasons why. So the the answer for me is, I don't really know. So let's look at the two sides uh, taken by, you know, both leftists, both people who are rooting for Syriza, rooting for an end to austerity, and why they they come down on, on both sides of this issue. So... Um, Nantina Vgonsas, uh, her essay starts, that the Greek government blinked last Friday has become increasingly clear. And her assessment of the deal uh, is this, and I'll, I'll quote from her essay. It says, what we have then is essentially a slightly more humane implementation of austerity. Austerity with some anti-poverty measures, coupled with a firmer commitment to combating tax evasion. As for the minimum wage, pensions, privatizations, trade union rights, these remain to be determined. But at this point, we have little reason to be optimistic. So just to clarify and take a step back, um, they had these uh, these talks in Brussels and it was decided at the end to uh, continue the uh, to, to um, uh, what is this precise term because it figures in to extend uh, the arrangement that they had um, for four months and then come together uh, to to sort of continue the talks uh, and see sort of where things have have shaken out over the four months. Um, so the question is uh, about uh, what to extend. So that's Nantina's. Um, uh, analysis. It's, it, it basically s- extends austerity with some sort of kinder, uh, gentler, happier uh, trappings on it. Um, she she mentions uh, sort of going forward uh, about the sort of political necessity, a- a- as she talked about on the last show, to um, sort of create a politics around Grexit, the Greek exit from the euro, um, because that's really the only leverage that the Greeks have over uh, the euro group, the ECB, uh, and German capital is the threat to leave the euro, which at the moment would be very politically uh, uh, unpopular and would 
lose Syriza a great amount of support among the Greeks. So she thinks that they should be fostering uh, uh, this sort of politics in Greece to, to sort of buttress their uh, leverage in these talks. And she mentions in this essay in Jacobin, uh, from the New Deal in the United States to neoliberalism in Chile, states historically have had to either convince or outright compel domestic capitalists to accept economic restructuring. Uh, uh, and then skipping a couple paragraphs, the leadership of Syriza, however, has now shown quite clearly that that's not their end game. They gestured at this months before the election when they said they wouldn't nationalize banks, and now they've demonstrated that they were actually committed to that position. At most, their plan for disciplining capital entails taxing it, which would be a major change given the extent of tax evasion, but still not enough to forge a truly anti-austerity politics. This, then, is perhaps the clearest lesson from Friday's deal. Reversing austerity will require confronting political and business elites, both foreign and domestic, head on. So I think there's a uh, lot to be said for that position, um, that there, this, this extension of by four months is, uh, you know, continues lots of the austerity policies, but um, maybe allows for some changes. Uh, and that's essentially Galbraith's uh, position, too, except he takes a much more uh, he, he, he thinks that the result of the talks is much more salutary. Um, he, turning to his piece, which is called Reading the Greek Deal Correctly, uh, it, which is in on a website called Social Europe, socialeurope.eu. Who knew about that? I didn't. Uh, he writes um, that uh, in order to meet the electoral commitments that Syriza made, which is specifically not to pull out of uh, the, the euro, uh, in order to meet the electoral commitments, the relationship between Athens and Europe had to be, quote, extended in some way acceptable to both. But extend what exactly, he writes. There were two phrases at play. So now we're going to get into like some nitty gritty of like the terminology in a legal deal. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to be lawyers for a second. But extend what exactly? There were two phrases at play and neither was the vague, quote, extend the bailout. The phrase extend the current program, spelled in its charmingly European way, P-R-O-G-R-A-M-M-E, appeared in Troika documents, implying acceptance of the existing terms and conditions. To the Greeks, this was unacceptable, but the technically more correct, quote, extend the loan agreement was less problematic. The final document extends the, quote, Master Financial Assistance Facility Agreement, which was better still. The, MMF, the MFFA is, quote, underpinned by a set of commitments, but these are technically distinct. In short, the MFFA is extended, but the commitments are to be reviewed. So this is very, very technical stuff, uh, but obviously, like, that is the point of negotiations, coming to some sort of, like, technical agreement that allows both sides to save face. He mentions also there was a lovely word arrangement, which the Greek team spotted in a draft communique offered by Eurogroup president something fucking, I don't know how the goddamn hell to pronounce this name, on Monday afternoon and proceeded to deploy it with abandon. Um, and just uh, to, to round uh, his thing out, I'll, I'll read you two last little things. Um, one thing he says is, if you think you can find an unwavering commitment to the exact terms and commitments of the current program in that language, good luck to you. It isn't there. So no, the Troika can't come to Athens and complain about the rehiring of cleaning ladies. Uh, and, and this is what Nantina uh, hinted at when she said that, uh, you know, it was austerity, but with some sort of kinder, gentler sort of anti-poverty measures. Um, and then lastly, Jamie Galbraith uh, points out that uh, to, do, to dig into the Memorandum of Understanding, um, uh, w which is like a, a very vilified thing, because this is basically the way that the IMF and ECB have come in and like imposed austerities through this memorandum. He mentions that uh, provisions, that it's not all bad, actually. Uh, provisions relating to tax administration, tax evasion, corruption, and modernization of public administration are... Uh, broadly, good policy and supported by Syriza. So it was not difficult for the new Greek government to state adherence to, quote, 70% of the memorandum. So he basically says that the remaining 30% uh, falls into areas where they, they have more wiggle room than they did before. Um, they came out of these... Uh, these um, uh, talks with more wiggle room, he thinks, and he thinks that... Uh, um, 
uh, here, I'll, I'll read you the last paragraph because it's, it's, I think, the uh, sort of closest to summation of his position. Alexis Tsipras stated it correctly. Greek, Greece won a battle, perhaps a skirmish, and the war continues. But the political sea change that Syriza's victory has sparked goes on. From a psychological standpoint, Greece has already changed. There is a spirit and dignity in Athens that was not there six months ago. Soon enough, new fronts will open in Spain, then perhaps Ireland, and later Portugal, all of which have elections coming. It is not likely that the government in Greece will collapse or yield in the talks ahead, and over time the scope of maneuver gained in the first skirmish will become more clear. In a year, the political landscape of Europe may be quite different from what it appears to be today. So, just to recap really briefly, Nantina Gonsa says this is basically a capitulation by the Greeks, who took a basically an extension, a four-month extension of austerity, uh, and sort of signaled their unwillingness to make the big uh, political leap toward, say, nationalizing the, ca- the banks or imposing capital controls or, or fostering a sort of pro-Grexit uh, politics in Greece, um, and that in order to uh, change course, they'll really have to confront capitalists head on and just basically compel them to accept the change in policy. And Jamie Galbraith says that, no, actually, the, the technical wording of the document uh, manages to give Greece a lot more wiggle room over the next four months, and that the political change happening in Greece that's sort of spreading to these other peripheral European countries uh, will sort of increase uh, the the Greek political standing with respect to European capital and put them on much firmer negotiating ground uh, four months from now. So those are the sort of the two um, sides to the argument. They're, they're, in some ways, they're commensurate, but uh, they, they sort of cast uh, a more favorable view uh, of, of one side's terms than the others. So that's basically um, my understanding of where we now stand in Greece. What do you think, Alexis? I mean, I don't know. I, I kind of feel like small gains are important, and it seems like, you know, if a lot can happen in the four months, then maybe it is worth claiming victory. Um, but I also know that a lot of people were disappointed, like, you know, over a month ago when Syriza gave up the sort of demand to nationalize the bank. So I guess I, I fall somewhere in the middle, like maybe cautiously optimistic. How about that? Yeah, I think that sounds about right. You know, I mean, politics is so fucking hard. The, the thing is that Greece doesn't really have, I mean, uh, as Nantina points out, apart from a Grexit, uh, they don't really have any leverage. Uh, and actually, I'm not sure how much leverage a Grexit is. Like, why wouldn't the the Eurogroup want to, or, or like, what, what, what makes the possibility of Greece leaving the monetary union so intolerable to European capital? I don't really know. I mean, I think they could probably tolerate it, maybe just because it would send a signal to other countries that they also could uh, exit the eurozone. But even that, like, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I'm, maybe I'm just sort of speaking out of turn because I don't really know the the intricacies of this. But um, in any case, the, the the Greeks basically seem to have no leverage except for like w- such political power as can be marshaled in the in you know the streets and in the voting booths, um, and so you know I, I, I'm sort of prepared to accept. It, it it seems to me that they made every you know really every attempt to uh, secure good terms, and if they couldn't, I, I'm sort of tempted to chalk that up to. Uh, something other than like their unwillingness to stand up for the Greek working class. Well, and I also think that like political victories build over time and that it's important to have people saying that this is a horrible deal and, you know, you're selling us out because it's important to open up that space on the left. But I also think that just because, you know, you lose now or partially lose now doesn't mean that you aren't building for something further down the line. Now, I I know that a lot of people are concerned that this is sort of the last hope, and if the left doesn't show, like, these immense victories, then the right wing will catch on in Europe. But I'm just not sure that I'm entirely convinced that that's the case. Like, I think these kinds of things sometimes take years and years to build. And just because, you know, everything doesn't happen this time doesn't mean it's not a victory that can't lead to larger victories farther down the line. Yeah, exactly. That'll be the question. Like, do... do when they are able to secure what, whatever terms they're able to secure or they have secured this time around or are, will be able to secure in four months, like what position does that leave the, the Greek anti-austerity movement in politically? Like do, do the terms set them up for future losses? Do the terms set them up for future wins? I mean, I think this is really the question and, you know, there, there really will be no way to tell that except for, you know, waiting and seeing. Yep. Yep. 
Well, again, I guess the message is watch this space. <laughs> we'll keep you posted as the situation. Yeah, happens. yes. This is this is our this is our new uh, this is our new sort of motto. Is like we're gonna give you a story that's pretty inconclusive to keep you coming. Back. <laughs> but let us know what you think. Like, who do you think is right out of the positions that Jesse outlined, or do you have a position somewhere in the middle, or somewhere totally not even on that graph? Uh, definitely let us know. Tweet at us. Hashtag Discon and tell us what you guys think. Um, yeah, definitely. We want to know where you weigh in and uh, Alexis, take us into our interview. So next up, we're going to hear from Deanda Wiley and Tasha Courtright, who are two former Everest College students, which was a part of the for-profit Corinthian Colleges, Inc., who have both gone on strike against their federal student loans. Corinthian, which is the college that they attended, has been charged with not just juicing their job placement numbers, paying people to temporarily hire graduates so that it sounds like they have better job placement numbers than they did, but also with predatory lending. But in spite of all of that, the students are still on the hook for the loans, even though most employers laugh at their degrees. So we're going to talk to them. That's next. Here are two separate interviews with the Corinthian 15. These are 15 students who have declared that they will not pay their federal student loans because they got worthless degrees from Everest College, which is a college under the for-profit Corinthian Colleges, Inc., which has been sued for predatory lending by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and pursued for other fraudulent behavior by various other law enforcement agencies. Many politicians have called on the Department of Education to forgive the debts of Corinthian students, including Massachusetts Attorney General Maura Healey, Representative Maxine Waters from California, and 13 separate U.S. senators who all co-signed a letter uh, led by Elizabeth Warren. But so far, the Department of Education has not heeded their calls to erase this illegitimate debt. An all-volunteer group called the Debt Collective, which sprung out of the group Strike Debt, which sprung out of Occupy Wall Street, has been helping the Corinthian 15 organize. And full disclosure, yours truly is a volunteer organizer with the Debt Collective. So now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's talk to Tasha Courtright and Deanda Wiley, who are both former students of Everest College, which is one of the companies owned by the for-profit Corinthian Colleges, Inc., I'm very happy to welcome to the show Tasha Courtright. Tasha is a member of the Corinthian 15. Tasha, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, you're welcome. No problem. So I'd love to just begin at the beginning. How did you first enroll in Everest? What were you hoping to study? And what was the whole enrollment and then the studying at Everest experience like for you? I actually went with a friend that wanted to go down there and find out more because she was thinking about um, enrolling. I did not actually go to enroll, and when I got there with her, I was swarmed by people, and um, they were telling me, if you don't do it now, you'll never do it, and you need to, you need a college degree to have any kind of living wage job, and I persistently told them that, of course, I would love to go to college, But um, I couldn't afford to go to college. I was working a minimum wage job living in low-income housing at at that time, which I'm still in low-income housing. I told them I would think about it, and they still pressured me, and they said, well, can we at least see if you qualify for the loan, or not for the loans, I'm sorry, for the grants, Mm -hmm. and you wouldn't have to take out any loans. And I told them, well, that's the only way I will ever attend college is if I have grants that completely cover because I can't afford any kind of loan. And they proceeded to run some numbers and told me that I actually qualified for the Cal Grant and I qualified for Pell Grant. And that with the numbers that my income was and the amount I would be getting, that I wouldn't have to worry about tuition at all. That sounds like a deal you can't refuse, right? How how close to reality did that end up being, that those promises they made to you? (laughs) 
Um, not even a little bit. They, uh, I actually went home. I didn't sign up that day. I went home and they, I told them I would think about it and I was a little skeptical, but I'm, I've never been to college. I'm the first in my family to go to college. So no, I had no, I don't know how the college system works. So I had to trust them what they were telling me because they're supposed to be the professionals and this is their job. So, um, they called me and called me and called me the next day, and I finally said, all right, well, if I do qualify, then I, you know, it's only going to do something good for my life. So I went down there and proceeded to sign up for the criminal justice um, program, and they were telling, they didn't even tell me I didn't even need it for what I was thinking about being a probation officer. And um, I signed up, and... I was told I had the grants, both of them. And then three months into my my first year, I got a letter from the state saying I was denied for the grant. And I was completely taken back. I went straight to the financial aid office and asked them, what is this? Why am I getting denied when you guys said I was already approved? And they right. said, well, well you, you've been out of high school too long. You have to complete... I think it was 36 units before you can um, apply for this grant. And I was I, I was confused. I was like, what are you talking about? You said I was already approved and it was coming in, you know? So they're like, well, we're sorry somebody gave you the wrong information. So I had class that day. I went back to class. And then I think it was the next day they called me out of class and they said, well, we pulled – um, some loans for you. We've taken out some loans for you so to cover the last three months you've been here since your Cal grant didn't go through. And I said, I told you I can't afford loans. And they said, well, you have two choices. You either sign the loan documents or you have to pay in full immediately. I, I mean, I didn't even know what to think at that point. I was so upset. I asked them, um, well, if I was to apply after my 36 units, and I do get this Cal grant because I was so low income, there was no way to not be approved. Mm-hmm. Um, they said, I asked them, I said, can I use that grant to cover these loans you just took out for me? And they said, absolutely, it's your money. It's a grant. You can use it for whatever you like. Right. So I, I okay, I feel comfortable with that. You know, if, if I'm going to be able to use it towards these loans, then I'm, I don't have to pay these loans back because I'm in school and they're deferred until the end anyway. Mm-hmm. So I felt that it was going to be covered. And then I did apply, but I didn't get approved for a year. It took a year because you only can apply once a year, and I didn't right. know that either. So by the time I applied and got approved, it was already towards the end of my associate's degree. And then as soon as I got the letter that I was approved, I went straight to financial aid again. I said, here you go. Here's my letter. Can you guys apply it towards the loans you took out for me? And they said, uh, we can't do that. You can only use it for future classes. So they basically lied to you twice, it sounds like. Once at the point of enrollment and then again when you were, it sounds like, threatening to possibly withdraw because you said to them, I don't want to take out any loans. I was very clear. And it sounds like they lied to you a second time at that point. Exactly. And so what happened since? Did you finish at Everest? Did you try to go somewhere else? Have I did finish. I did finish my associates, and I had just gotten approved for two years of my Cal grant, and I had the Pell grant, which I ended up going back for my bachelor's, and the whole thing was paid for by my grants like I was supposed to do for my um, my associates. I wasn't aware of everything that was going on with Everest. As I was going, I I was hearing things here and there, like, oh, they did this to me. The veterans, oh, they're not giving me my my extra pay that's supposed to go through my housing. Things like that were going on that I was hearing more and more during my bachelor's degree. And I was just like, wow, you know, they did this to me and this to me. Because I really thought maybe it was just the wrong information. And then I was seeing that I had a teacher come in on my bachelor's degree and he said I'm sorry I'm late I just got the call late last night that I was teaching this class I've never taught this class before so I guess we're going to be learning it together wow I was like what (laughs) you don't even know what you're teaching 
but they're telling you to teach this. And on another, um, I, uh, I believe it was management accounting or something like that, um, I took that class and the teacher actually gave us our homework and gave us the answers to the homework before we turned it in. And then we also got copies of our midterms and our finals with the answers on it. So I was just like, I actually, four weeks into that class, a couple of the other students felt the same way I did. We weren't learning anything. And we went in and complained to the department chair and the dean about this class and how our classes are becoming where, you know, we're not learning anything. They're giving us the answers. And this specific teacher, we weren't learning anything. And we were like, we went out of this class. They wouldn't let us out because it was past the drop in, or drop and add week. And they never replaced the teacher. They never let us take the class again. I learned, I, that was a waste of, what, like fifteen, two thousand dollars $2,000. I mean, the whole experience was just, honestly, what, <laughs> the few little things I did get out of it, I could have learned working somewhere. It, it was you, nothing. What what has been the experience as a graduate of Everest going out into the world and trying to get a job? Like, what is your experience interviewing? What do people say when they look at your resume? Let's put it this way. I, w I went there four years. I have a bachelor's degree. And the bachelor's was in business management. And um, I had a 4.0. And I have yet. I graduated in 2012. And I started looking for work at the end of my uh, associate's degree, and I have yet to have a job interview that has to do with my degree. And so I think that you are not the only one in this position. It seems like that is what we hear over and over again from graduates from Everest, is that you know employers don't really consider it a qualifier and that people have an enormous amount of trouble getting work. And it just kind of seems like you guys were sold a defective product. They didn't um, teach us the basics of what we needed to know. A fellow striker of my Nathan, he went on an interview. I, I don't know how he got the interview, but he, he had an interview. And when the interviewer asked him you know, about sales journals, he had never heard of one. <laughs> and the, the guy actually told him, you have a degree in business management and you don't know what a sales journal is? And honestly, yeah. I have the same degree and I, I couldn't tell you what it is. So is this part of the why you decided to strike? What led you to the point where you decided, you know what, I'm not waiting anymore. I'm going to strike my federal debt. This is the right thing to do. What brought you to that point? I, I felt lost for a while. I felt like I didn't know what to do. I actually contacted a lawyer before all this began, and he didn't want anything to do with it. But um, I, I had a baby during my bachelor's degree and she has special needs and um i couldn't work because she had a hold in her heart and she has down syndrome and there was a lot of things going on with that and not that i didn't want to work i planned on going back to work but i just either way it would just put more pressure on me and i'm sitting here looking at my life going i basically have a mortgage payment that they want me to pay, and because my degree costs ninety six thousand dollars, and I have nothing to show for it, mm -hmm. I went into this expecting to come out with a degree, a quality education, and something I could show an employer that I can do this job. I can do this job. I've been taught how to do everything you need me to do. And I wasn't taught anything, nothing that they need to do. I haven't even gotten a call back for an interview. I've gotten interviews at Starbucks to be a barista, but when I went to that interview, they told me I was overqualified. Wow. And when I go to management, when I went and interviewed for management, they kind of just blew me off. You know, I mean, I, I don't know what else to do because taking out these loans for all of us, was to better our lives. People can sit there and stereotype and say people in low income are lazy, people in low income make bad choices in their lives, and that isn't the case at all. That isn't mm -hmm. the case at all. A lot of us were born into families that don't have a lot to provide. They can't pay for college. They can't um, do those things for us that the 1% can, you know. So, And with how 
it is getting a job nowadays. You need a college degree to get anything that is outside of fast food. You know, so it's either accept your life as it is and work two to three jobs just to have a low-income housing over your head and never see or raise your children, or you can go to college and better your life and work hard and get to where you want to be. And that's what that was what all of our intentions were. We made the right decisions. We were not lazy. We gave up time with our families. We gave up years of our lives to do this. And for the outcome of a job that would provide stability and give our kids what we need, and none of us have it. Mm-hmm. We can't even get an interview to show that we're hardworking because we don't have the skills that we should have after getting these degrees. Yeah, it strikes me that all of you did, just as you said, Tasha, the exact right thing. And everyone says, you know, don't study anything fluffy. Go get a trade degree, get a business degree, get a nursing degree. And all of the strikers did that. And you guys, you know, just like you said, took out time out of your lives to try to pursue what you are told to pursue, which is education. And you were essentially given a faulty degree. Um, And your strike is essentially in a way been validated by a huge amount of people in the policy spectrum and in like law enforcement and uh, like policymakers like Massachusetts Attorney General Maura Healey has called on the Department of Education to forgive your debt. Representative Maxine Waters from California has called for that. Uh, 13 senators co-signed a letter calling on the DOE to forgive the debt. So I think you guys are on really strong ground. But the difference is you're not waiting you're saying this is wrong and I'm willing to stand up. And I think that's really, really brave of all of you guys to unite together and do that. Yeah, it's scary, but I have learned over the years that with when it comes to the government, it's you don't get anything unless you fight for it. Yeah. I had to fight I had to fight for my daughter to get her SSI that she was owed. I mean, I don't want to say owed because that's the wrong thing, but when you have when you have a child with a disability or a special needs, they automatically, with Down syndrome, qualify for SSI, and I was denied. I had to fight for it. You know, I, they they denied me because I had me and my fiance had each had a car, and they said we only needed one car. You know, and I'm like, okay, so she has specialists and doctors. I was at a point where I had eight appointments for her a week. How am I supposed to take her to her her specialist and her doctors and everything, and him go to him go to work? It just doesn't, doesn't work like that. It it just seems like they make it so hard for us to actually get ahead and be a productive member of society and that's all we're trying to do you know i i believe everybody has the right to an education just like they they forced all kids up to 18 to go to school which is good they need to go to school but in the in today's economy you have to have a college education to get anywhere you have to and to for the doe to let them continue to way overpriced their their uh, education, which I wouldn't call it an education. Mm-hmm. And, um, th- I mean, I heard about this investigation when it was starting, and it started way back, I believe, in 2007, 2008. And that's when I started school. And I went to the DOE hearing and told them to their face, how are you going to investigate a school for seven years? How long does it take to realize that they're committing fraud, that they're lying to us. And, like, I, when I signed up, they told me their placement rates were at, like, 91%. They had a wall at my school with job openings, and they were all ads from Craigslist and Monster.com. I, I kept going to Chris Services. I can do this at home. What are you getting paid for? I was told you guys had a network and relationships with companies that – were wanting to interview your graduates and never once have I had an interview because of them, you know, and it's just ridiculous. I mean, I could have done that from home, and they, the only jobs they offered me with criminal justice were um, security guard positions, which pay like 9 to $10 an hour. Right, which you probably didn't need a, a degree to get. No, well, you I don't. think you don't even need a degree to do be a cop. Or they're all civilian jobs, and they don't tell you that. 
Well, I think you guys said it really well in the letter that you wrote. You can check out this letter at debtcollective.org slash student strike. But it's the letter to the Department of Education, and it starts off, Who are we? We are the first generation made poor by the business of education. I think what you said is really key, Tasha. It shouldn't be this way, but it seems like in order to get the government to do the right thing, we always have to fight. And you guys are standing up and fighting, and you have a lot of people uh, that are supporting you increasingly. And so I just thank you for joining us today, and thank you for your bravery. And hopefully the Department of Education will wake up and do the right thing and discharge all of the Corinthian debt. I hope so, too, because, the, I mean, education shouldn't be a business. It's a necessity. It's a basic need nowadays, and it just shouldn't be a profitable, like, business where all they care about is making profits. It just shouldn't be that way. We should all have a chance to have a good job and take care of our families. I couldn't agree more. Well, we're going to leave it at that. But Tasha Courtright, thank you so much for joining us today on Disorderly Conduct. You're very welcome. So we just spoke to Tasha Courtright. Now we turn to Deanda Wiley, who is another member of the Corinthian 15 Strikers. Deanda, thanks so much for joining us today. So I wanted to ask you how you first came about enrolling in Everest. Uh, You know, what were you hoping to study and how did you end up there? I seen an ad on TV and I wanted to better myself because I had two kids I wanted to give a better life to. And I enrolled in paralegal studies and I actually have a degree, my associate's degree and a bachelor's degree that are useless. Both from Everest? Yes. And what was your experience like at Everest? What did you feel about like the quality of the teaching? What was your experience in terms of like loans? Did they try to, did they make any promises to you they couldn't keep? What was your experience like at the school? Well, before I enrolled, I was I was being I was called all the time about because I called and checked. I just wanted to you know check and see you know what my options were because I've always wanted to go back to school. The teachers, I don't know, it just they seem kind of I don't know if they were fake or if they were, are real. You know, they just didn't seem to know a lot. And then like probably five months before I graduated with my bachelor's degree. I they, I was told I was fifty six hundred dollars short, and if I didn't get if I couldn't qualify for a private loan, I was gonna be kicked out. I wouldn't get my diploma. I wouldn't be able to graduate. So I had so I ended up having to get a private loan through Genesis. So just in case listeners aren't familiar, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has sued the parent of Everest College, Corinthian, for these Genesis loans that Deanda took out. They allege that Corinthian used illegal debt collection tactics to strong arm students into paying these loans while they were still in school, that they advertised bogus job prospects and career services and were artificially raising tuition costs in order to uh, meet what's called the 90-10 rule, which is that uh, only 90 percent of a four profit colleges tuition can be met from federal loans so they would artificially raise tuition for students into genesis loans um, in order to continue to meet the 90 10 rule and the cfpb has also announced that 40 percent of these genesis loans will have their principal immediately forgiven and at some point in the future the rest of the genesis loans will also be forgiven because the cfpb found them to be predatory Deanda, did Everest make any kind of promises to you, like at the beginning, because you mentioned they called you a lot? Did they try to tell you that you were going to be able to get grants or that it wasn't going to be that expensive? Did they tell you anything like that when you first enrolled? They said I wouldn't have a problem, and they said that as soon as I graduated, they would place me into, you know, place me into a job so that um, so I could start my career, and that never happened. All I received was like links from Craigslist, Monster.com, Career Builder, things I could have done myself. And what's your experience been like having an Everest degree and going and trying to find work? Have you been trying to find work as a paralegal and what's that been like? After I graduated with my bachelor's degree, I kind of took a break because my father had passed away a couple months before I graduated. So I was just trying to, you know, get my head straight and recoup. But ever since then, I've been having, I haven't been able to find a job. And what do you feel is the value of your degree from Everest? Do you feel like you got what you paid for? No, I didn't get what I paid for. <laughs> I got ripped off. You know, attorneys here, they want three to five years experience. I do not have the experience. All I have is the degree. How did you first learn about the debt collective and the Corinthian strike? And what made you decide, once you did learn about it, to, to join the strike? I was getting frustrated and... um starting to get depressed so I just did a little search on Facebook to see if I could find anything 
on what was going on with because before um my last couple months in school people were already complaining they couldn't find a job that every uh attorneys were wanting um three you know at least five years experience they were scared they weren't going to be able to find one and it, and it kind of scared me there that was kind of that was more of a red flag yeah so when it was my turn to try to find a job it it was basically with how they described it just same you mean your your peers in, in Everest you had the same experience as them yeah we would talk about it in class did they tell you that it wasn't going to be the case? Did they say it won't be a problem? All you need is this paralegal degree and you'll be able to find work? Like, are those the sorts of promises that they made? They said they would place, they would place everybody in a job once you graduated. That was not the case at all. Yeah. And it's really frustrating. I, when I kept getting links to, you know, Career Builder or, you know, Monster.com, I'm like, what is this? Is it any job placement? Normally, they would have something going with an employer to place you in a job, my understanding. Yeah, I mean, there's supposed to be career services. They're supposed to arrange interviews for you. They're supposed to have connections. Um, and Tasha, it sounds like, had the same experience as you, is that she got forwarded things from Craigslist that she could have found completely on her own. The only thing that I found after I graduated was a type of an internship. That was it. And it's very frustrating because, you know, that wasn't enough. So do you have any particular message to the Department of Education who had for years uh, been basically allowing federal money to flow to this college in spite of the fact that it was so clearly not placing its students in well-paying jobs and really not living up to the quality of its diploma that they pretended it offered? Do you have any particular feelings about the Department of Education's responsibility and their lack of oversight? I think that they need to go after I think they need to pay just like any other person would if they, you know, fraud people. I think they should watch them more closely, you know. I think they should pay attention. I don't think it's right. Is there anything else you would like to say, either just to just the people listening to the show or to the Department of Education or just anything at all about your experience at Everest or your experience with the strike? Well, my experience with Everest, if I'd have known then what I know now, I would have never enrolled. And for yeah. the people on strike, it's heads up and team together. Thank you so much for joining us today. That does it for this edition of Disorderly Conduct. Please make sure that you follow us on Twitter at DIS underscore C-O-N. And please also make sure that you like us on Facebook. And subscribe and please rate us on iTunes. You can do that at bit.ly slash discontpodcast. And also, feel free to rate us on Stitcher. It really helps. So long, farewell, auf Wiedersehen.